Today, our gospel lesson is from John chapter 4, verses 43 to 54. Listen to these words from the gospel of John. When the two days were over, he went from that place to Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in the prophet's own country. When he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, since they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the festival, for they too had gone to the festival. Then he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had changed the water into wine. Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my little boy dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. As he was going down, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. So he asked them the hour when he began to recover. And they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he himself believed along with his whole household. Now this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for the gift of worship to gather together as your people in this place to sing, to pray, to glorify you, to reflect on your word. Lord, speak to us through your spirit at work in our lives. Give us the ears to hear, the minds to comprehend. And Lord, put us into motion, into action to go and to serve your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So my uh, goal today is I want you to learn four things. First is the importance and subtlety of geography. Don't fall asleep on me. In communicating the will of of God. And there's not going to be a quiz or anything, right? But for the Gospel of John, for John writing it, geography means everything. So there's significance in what that's communicating. The second thing is the centrality of belief and how that belief then m- molds our actions. Uh, that belief and action are tied intimately together. The second is that action leads to spiritual growth and a deepening faith. And then fourth, spiritual maturity leads to a transformed community, to a transformed house. Our text this morning is the end of what most scholars call the Cana to Cana cycle, which essentially is the first missionary journey of Jesus. And you can throw up the the slide here. Uh, all right. So we've got this uh, map that I stole off of, uh, I don't know, it says not licensed. Something, history. Yeah, I just stole it from Google Images. Oh, yeah, Bible History Online. So I took it from there, and then I marked it up a little bit. So in the Gospel of John, this is the very beginning of Jesus's. Jacob, do you have your pointer finger? I need that thing right here. Um, So he's got this giant finger that you can just kind of point to things. So Jesus, uh, so the ministry starts, Jesus is baptized. We can say that's the start of his ministry. And so the baptism, guess what, takes place at point number one. After that, uh, they move up to, they move north up to Bethsaida, and then they move from there, from Bethsaida to Cana. And this is where this cycle, the Cana to Cana cycle, 
begins. And so when Jesus is in Cana, he performs his first miracle, which the first miracle in according to the Gospel of John is what? Wow, all right, everybody needs to join a meeting. Um, I'm just kidding. Maybe that joke really fell flat. Uh, and uh, so he starts off in Cana. And so he turns water into wine. He's at a wedding. His mother's there. He had called some disciples in uh, uh, Bethsaida, and then they're over in Cana. After Cana, they then decide to move uh, over to this small uh, fishing town in Capernaum, and then from there, they journey south to Jerusalem, which is number five, and they're in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festival. So they were there for uh, at least a week celebrating that. And so while Jesus is in, um, when Jesus is in Jerusalem celebrating Passover, this is when, according to John, he goes into the temple, uh, he cleanses it, and he performs other uh, miracles. And then after, after Jerusalem, they then head north, uh, up, you see Alexandrium there. They head up north, just north of there to the six mark, uh, which is uh, Salim, or that is what the Judean countryside. And so John the Baptist was uh, baptizing followers there. Uh, Jesus was baptizing followers there as well. From there, uh, they head west. And so when they head west, they go to Samaria. And in Samaria, this is where Jesus encounters a woman at the well. And after encountering this woman and offering her uh, living water, which is different than physical water that we would drink, it's a spiritual water. This woman responds to this gift that Jesus has given her, and they run back. She runs back into the town, and she proclaims this message uh, that Jesus has come uh, and set her free. From Samaria, Jesus, the disciples, his mom, we assume is with her. They move up from, uh, they move up from uh, Samaria, and they go up back to Cana. And that's where our text takes place today. Now, what's the significance of the Cana to Cana cycle? What's significant about Jesus' movement around this region and him performing miracles. Anybody want to take a guess? All right, nobody's that bold. I don't blame you. I he was gaining in popularity, right? So news was, news was spreading. There was certainly news spreading, and that's why this official comes to him uh, today. Well, this is the importance of the, the geography, or geography and the telling of the story uh, from John's perspective. So Jesus is encountering, uh, during the Passover season, he's encountering Jewish people, other people that are like him. And then Jesus, after encountering people, performing miracles, and revealing that the Son of God is here, Jesus then moves from an area that and a celebration that was exclusively for Jewish people, he moves north to Samaria. Now, Samaritans were considered half-blooded Jews. They were uh, in a large number of Jews that had been taken in exile. And when they were captured in exile, uh, after hundreds of years of exile, some of them had established roots. They'd established families, uh, new customs, new towns, and all this kind of stuff. So when, they were, when the Jewish people were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and set free from their captives, they, uh, some chose not to go. And so to the Jewish people that went back to Jerusalem, that was wildly offensive. And that's where we get a lot of the Samaritans as unclean, half-Jewish uh, people in that region and where some of that strife and tension uh, comes from. So Jesus goes to this woman who is considered to be unclean, by Jewish religious standards. Then they travel from Samaria. So Jesus has now ministered and proclaimed the good news to Jewish people. He's now proclaimed to the Samaritan people, and he moves north 
And when he gets back to Cana, where he had performed the first miracle, Jesus encounters a royal official. Now, a royal official was likely not Jewish, likely not Samaritan. He was part of the Roman Empire. He was a Gentile. So now Jesus has, in the very beginning of his ministry, has now gone to three different groups of people. People that the others that followed Jesus, the, the Jews that were following Jesus would have been like, whoa, what are you doing? You're going and talking to who? You're going and ministering to who? You're performing miracles to who and doing what? There's deep, significant meaning in what John's trying to teach us and convey to us about who the gospel is for. And that's that you and I have, we do not have exclusive rights to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we think we have exclusive rights to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is a sin in our lives and a sin uh, for us. The gospel is for all people. The geography of John's telling of the gospel has that as a theological significance. Now, also in our text this morning, belief is central theme. We see belief in the response of this royal official who is seeking healing from, uh, on behalf of his dying son. The official demonstrates a belief in Jesus's ability to heal. Now, as Eric had pointed out, there were a lot of people that were he hearing what Jesus was doing. And this was creating some disruption. It was creating some people that were naysayers. It was creating people that were super excited, right? A bunch of people had been gone to John. They had gone to Jesus. They had been baptized. There was a revolution, a movement that was taking place and happening as Jesus was going to all of these different groups of people and proclaiming the good news of salvation through him. So this royal official hears that message and he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, heal my son. Now, what I find most surprising in this text is that Jesus kind of rebukes the guy. He pushes back. And that was really troubling for me. Jesus uh, but when I was unpacking a little bit, I think Jesus uh, wanted to just clarify what, what are this guy's intentions, this royal official? What are his intentions for coming and seeking healing? Is it that he's tried everything? He's seen shamans and other uh, medical people. He's taken them to, I don't know, witch doctors. I don't know, some, something else, trying to seek anything for his son, and as a last resort, maybe he's going to see Jesus. I think Jesus is, is pushing back and saying, well, if you see signs and wonders, then you'll believe. And the guy's like, no, I believe before the signs and the wonders. And he says, heal my son. And it's in that moment of his belief that Jesus says, your son will live. And so the guy leaves. The, um, he doesn't back down. The guy ends up leaving, and he goes back to his house. And on, on his way back home to Capernaum, he finds and discovers that his son, in fact, is living as, and testifies to the work that Jesus has been doing. He believes the word of God. He recognizes the power of Jesus' command over life and death. The healing occurring from a distance underscores, underscores Jesus' divine authority. The official's journey back to, back to Capernaum then becomes a testament, a testimony to the transforming power of belief in our lives, in his life. And as a result, his household, influenced by this firsthand witness of the healing, the household, the other people uh, in this royal official's family, they too believe. See, there is a rippling effect when we encounter the power of Jesus. 
Now, this comes on the heels of the Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus at the well. And as I said, she goes back into the town and she shares the story. This guy goes back to his town, finds out that his son has been healed, and his community, his house is transformed. Something is remarkable is happening when people have an encounter and a belief in who Jesus is. So how might this text speak to us this morning? How does it speak to our sermon series on stewardship? Well, one way to look at it is to see our church as a home base for what Christ is doing in our midst. It starts here. It starts with our belief and trust in God that he will bring healing and wholeness to this place. It starts with us realizing that we do not have the authority to include or exclude anyone from this church, that all are welcome. And faith becomes a heck of a lot easier when we relinquish the control, when we allow the spirit of God to work rather than trying to do it ourselves. See, I only have to proclaim and testify to the truth I only have to share my story about how God has liberated and redeemed me. And I let God and the Spirit of God at work in our community, in this church, in Morristown, in our surrounding neighborhoods. I allow the Spirit of God to be working in people. I don't have to worry about being controlling. I don't have to worry about worrying about about it. I all I God is saying is trust, believe in me. And this transformation will come. Second, our beliefs are tied to our actions. We see our beliefs, what we believe, they take place right before us. I had a baseball coach uh, in high school, Tom Horton. He used to say, your actions speak so loud, I can hardly hear what you're saying. Your actions speak so loud, I can hardly hear what you're saying. And he used to say, you know, 96% of all uh, communication is nonverbal. You see, our actions communicate a lot more. Our inaction communicates a lot more. We may have a belief. We may think something. But do we do anything about that belief? People complain all the time. All the time. It's it's part of our nature, right? Oh, the church isn't what it used to be. The church isn't what it used to be. People don't volunteer anymore. People don't come to these things. There are soccer games and hockey games and all this other kind of stuff that has grown more important. Yeah, that's true. But why is that true? It's true because we've never really taken hold of our belief and allowed our belief to transform us so that we act differently. Our belief transforms us. We might say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to put him over here. I'll come back to him when I need him again. You know, that last resort, like Jesus is making sure that the royal official's son, that's why Jesus wants to make sure that he's not doing that. Right? We want to pull out Jesus when it's convenient for us. Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, maybe once a month, if I'm really committed, once a month. I think that's the statistic in Pew Research is uh, somebody that's considered a regular faithful attender of church worship uh, attends once a month. We've got very, very low standards. Our beliefs are tied to our actions. Our actions speak about who we are. What do we do? Where do we spend our time? Is our time spent in devotion and service to God? Or is it spent staring at Facebook or TikTok? Is it spent doing homework? Homework's important, kids. Do your homework. Less TikTok, more homework, more God, all right? Not necessarily that order. Our beliefs are tied to our actions. What do we do? What do we believe? Our beliefs are tied to 
our wallets. Barry shared a remarkable story about faith. Lord, if you want me to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, I'll do it because you tell me that that's the way it ought to be. I don't necessarily like it. I may not necessarily agree with it, but Lord, I am going to do it. And in that humility, in that moment of vulnerability, in that moment of trust and believing in God, we see something amazing happen, right? Do we trust God with our wallets? I'll tell you, there was a time in my life where I did not trust God with my wallet. And I wanted to pursue things. Lord, if I could just make more money, I would be able to give more to charity, to give more to church, if I could just get more. And what I found out is I wasn't pursuing God. I was pursuing money. I was pursuing those other things that can get in the way and interfere. But what I have to learn in my belief and putting my belief into action is absolute trust in who Jesus is. Because Jesus takes care of our household. Jesus takes care of our church. He takes care of our individual household. When we put our full reliance, our full faith in Jesus Christ and follow him. And when we follow him, we need to allow his Holy Spirit to take root and transform our lives. Our actions are prompted by the Spirit at work in our community and in us. What is Christ calling you to today? Is Christ calling you to check yourself before you wreck yourself? No. Uh, is, God, is God choosing you to examine yourself? To say, Lord, why... Why is it that I follow you, and what does my following of you look like? Is it a check mark? Is it just to have you, uh, you know, in case of emergency, pull here? Or is it something else? Is it deeper and more meaningful and more impactful in our lives? Allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. Is God calling you to go to places and to people that may make you feel uncomfortable. God is with you. God goes before you. You don't have to go alone. Trust God with all of your heart. Follow God. Believe in him and allow the spirit to transform your faith. Amen. I invite the band to come up. We're going to uh, and invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you uh, for this day, Lord, and I thank you for the gospel of John, and I thank you for uh, this important uh, reminder that we are called to go to places that may make us feel uncomfortable, to people that may make us feel uncomfortable, Lord, but we are called to follow your example. Help us, Lord, to put all of our trust, all of our faith, believing that you will take care of of this church, of our homes, of our household, as long as we put our faith fully in you. Amen.